Hello everyone and welcome to Box Office Receipts. I'm your host Alec Callahan and we got a lot of news to talk about. We got new releases, Avatar has been dethroned from first place, we have a full week update on the Chinese New Year numbers, and a good amount of streaming updates as well. Let's start with the domestic top five. Opening first place is Knock at the Cabin with 14.1 million. Opening in second place is 80 for Brady with 12.7 million. Down in third place after over six weeks is Avatar The Way of Water with 11.3 million for a total of 636.9 million. In fourth place is Puss in Boots The Last Wish with 7.8 million for a total of 151.2 million. And in fifth place is BTS Yet to Come in Cinemas with 5.1 million for a total of 7.8 million. So let's start with the new movies. M. Night Shyamalan's latest film, Knock at the Cabin, had a decent opening. The good news is, like most Shyamalan movies, it's likely to make a profit at the box office with the movie costing about $20 million before advertising. The issue, however, is its legs might not be good. It got a C from audiences for CinemaScore, which is worse than the C-plus audiences gave for old. So between the Super Bowl next weekend and not great word of, word of mouth, this might drop faster than expected. We'll have to wait until the end of its run to see if it was a win for Universal. For Paramount, on the other hand, they might have had a small hit on their hands with 80 for Brady. Their opening was solid and got an A- for a cinema score, so its legs should be okay. That is going to be important because the issue with this film is the budget is $28 million, and I doubt there would be a strong international audience for this film, so they need to focus on domestic heavily. But look, if we can leg it out to $40-$50 $50 million at the box office, that's a solid start for Paramount for the year. For BTS, I believe that's a concert they filmed before going into active duty in the army, so it's no surprise BTS fans came out to watch it. As for other films, I'll give a quick update on those. A Man Called Otto is at 53 million, Missing is at 23 million, Megan is now at 87.6 million, Panthen is now at 14.2 million, and Plane is at 28.8 million. China's box office continues to do well thanks to the New Year movies. Moving back to first place is The Wandering Earth 2 with 55.9 million for a total of 497.9 million. In second place was Full River Red with 49.6 million for a total of 590.7 million. Boonie Bear's Guardian Code came in third place with another 20.9 million for a total of 186.4 million. Fourth place was Deep Sea with 13.8 million for a total of 98.8 million. And in fifth place was Hidden Blade with 11.6 million for a total of $117 million. Overall numbers are still solid for the movies, and when Deep Sea passed $100 million sometime this week, we'll have five of the films released for the holidays past $100 million each. For upcoming films, we do have Black Panther Wakanda Forever opening up on Tuesday, but again, that's not expected to make much. Looking at international numbers, Panthen is now at $95.1 million worldwide. Puss in Boots The Last Wish made another $17.1 million for a total of 368 million. 6 million worldwide. Knock at the Cabin made 7 million internationally for a worldwide opening of 21.2 million. For Paramount, the international market is carrying Babylon hard, though it won't be enough, with its international total now at 35.1 million. A Man Called Otto is at 53 million worldwide, and Megan is at 158.6 million worldwide. As for Avatar The Way of Water, well, it made another 27.9 million for a worldwide total of 2.17 billion worldwide. Now let's go to news in Hollywood and we start with an exclusive from Deadline and that is a fourth Riddick movie is in development called Riddick Fura. David Rowley is coming back to write and direct with Vin Diesel returning to play the title character. As for what studio will be distributing it we don't know yet as the film will be headed to the European film market looking for buyers. Personally I've not watched any of the Riddick films but I know it has a solid fan base so for them I'm happy they are seeing the franchise continue. Especially after the long 10 year wait. Next, let's take a quick look at Lionsgate's quarterly earnings, where they actually had a decent quarter. And they made 1 billion in revenue and overall made a profit of 16.6 million. This is a big improvement as this time last year they were reporting a $45 million loss. As for the split between Lionsgate and Stars, all executives had to say is that it is on track to be completed by September. Nothing was said about how it would actually happen. We have a small update on Cineworld, and that is they have worked on a restructure plan with their debt holders. If enacted, this restructure plan would get them out of bankruptcy, though no details were released about what is included in the plan. 
My bet is a lot of theaters sold off or closed. However, Cineworld is not rushing into restructuring just yet, as they are still working on a potential sale, which is still in development. I think if they can get a reasonable price, they will sell. I'm just not sure who would buy them. While it could be something fun like Apple or Amazon, I think realistically it will be a private equity fund. As for the other big theater chain, AMC, well, they have introduced something controversial this week, and that is Sightline AMC. What is Sightline? Well, it's a fancy way of saying the best theater seats are going to cost more. There are three tiers, value, standard, and preferred. Standard seats are the same price as they normally were. Value seats are the first few rows up front and will be cheaper than standard seats. And preferred seats are in the middle rows of a theater and will cost more than standard seats. If you are an A-list member, this will not apply to you as the extra cost for a preferred seat will be waived. As of now, though, this will only be in select markets and for movie showtimes after 4 p.m., though AMC has said that they plan on rolling it out more throughout the year. So while customers might not be too happy about this, uh, from a neutral perspective, this is a good move for the company. If the middle rows are always going to go first for a movie, and, and you know, they are considered some of the best seats in the house, then it makes sense to charge a little more as you'll get a little extra income, which they need, and the tickets will still be sold anyway. And look, the front rows are always considered the worst, so why not make them a bit cheaper to offer an incentive to buy them? I think AMC would prefer those seats selling at $7 a ticket than zero. And I'll be curious to see during their next quarterly earnings report if they mention this helping them or not. Now let's talk about the big news in Hollywood this week, and that is Disney, as a lot happened. First, they had their quarterly earnings report, where they announced that they beat analysts' expectations on revenue. However, they also announced the first ever loss of subscribers for Disney+, Plus, coming in at losing 2.4 million subscribers overall. Should be noted, however, that most of the subscriber loss was from Disney Plus Hotstar tier, as they lost the rights to the Indian Premier League for cricket. Disney Plus Worldwide now has 161.8 million subscribers, with Hulu at 48 million, and ESPN Plus is now at almost 24 million subscribers. The company also reconfirmed that they are still aiming for Disney Plus to hit profitability by 2024. With standard numbers out of the way, let's talk about the changes. Bob Iger announced that Disney will be looking to reduce 5.5 billion in costs for the company. Here's what he had to say about that. Quote, after a solid first quarter, we are embarking on a significant transformation, one that will maximize the potential of our world-class creative teams and our unparalleled brands and franchises. We believe the work we are doing to reshape our company around creativity while reducing expenses will lead to sustained growth and profitability for our streaming businesses, better position to us to weather future disruption and global economic challenges and deliver value for our shareholders, end quote. The first step of this, sadly, is layoffs, with it also being announced that 7,000 jobs will be cut worldwide. Hopefully those laid off will land on their feet quick. There's also an organizational change, with the company being reorganized into three parts. The first is entertainment. This will be led by Dana Walden and Alan Bergman, and will include all of the studios and streaming besides ESPN+. The second part will be just ESPN. will still be run by Jimmy Pitaro. The last part is parks, experiences, and products led by Josh DeArmo. Besides the layoffs and reorganization, Disney will also be looking to cut $3 billion in spending on content. This is part of the $5.5 billion in cuts they are doing. No shows or movies were announced to be cancelled during quarterly earnings, but what I, what I would guess that would happen is that less shows and films get greenlit. Basically, production is a pipeline and always has to keep moving, but what they can do is slow down the release of content, spread it out over time, and just make less. And then over time, that will help them save money. Separate from the quarterly earnings call, and instead in, on an interview with CNBC, when asked about Hulu, Bob Iger did not commit to buying out Comcast's stake of it next year. Quote, everything is on the table right now, so I'm not going to speculate whether we are a buyer or a seller, but I obviously have suggested that I'm concerned about undifferentiated general entertainment, particularly in the competitive landscape we are operating in, and we are going to look at it very objectively and expansively. End quote. This was a little surprising to hear, as it was always sounded like a sure thing. But if they need to pay off a lot of debt fast, they can sell their share of Hulu to Comcast or anyone else for, say, around $15 billion, which would do wonders for the company. Now, that would open up a can of worms as to what content Hulu actually has at this point. If Disney sells it off and pulls their shows, you know, it's questionable. But this shows that clearly Iger is looking to right to ship financially first 
before making any moves and growing the company. Another way Iger is looking to fix up Disney financially is to double down on their IPs in one of the most boring ways to announce a film. It was announced during the earnings call that a sequel to Toy Story, Frozen, and Zootopia are now in the works. Personally, I have no problem with a Frozen 3 or Zootopia 2 being made. Does make sense. Disney and Pixar have gotten lucky that 3 and 4 both made great endings to the franchise. So to try and risk that a third time, I don't know. It's a bit risky, but I do get it. Besides Lightyear, the actual Toy Story franchise is one that people of all ages love. That was a lot of news from Disney that came out with their earnings report. Personally, I think all of it are great steps in improving the company, except the layoffs. I feel if those need to happen, it should be after everything else was done first, and then see if you actually need to do it. But hey, I don't run a business. With all of these changes, there is one piece of immediate good news for Iger and Disney, and that is Nelson Peltz has stepped away from his proxy fight. With all of these changes, plus the announcement of Disney starting up their dividend again for shareholders by the end of the year, he is satisfied with the changes and is done. We got a few trailers. First is one for Amazon Studios uh, for Air. This would normally be in the VOD premium section, but hey, it's coming to theaters first. Personally, I found the trailer to be a bit odd. I do like the cast here, it's a great cast, but the tone felt weird. I don't think this is going to do well at the box office, to be honest. And the other trailer we got is, of course, the first one for Fast X, coming in at almost four minutes long. Seriously, the trailers for this franchise are going to become, starting to become short films. As for what's in it, personally, I don't really care anymore. Even though I found 9 to be a bit better than 8, Jason Momoa as a bad guy, he seems good. But with the huge cast now, it feels like they're just throwing stuff at the wall to see what sticks. VOD Premium is busy this week with a lot of updates from just about everyone, so let's get the small stuff out of the way first. We start with Sling, as they look to make every nude pushed into fast. Currently their offering is Sling Free, which is getting a new name and boosting content. Going forward it will be called Free Stream, and it will have 210 channels, up from 150 channels Sling Free had. It will also include 40,000 hours of on-demand content to watch and users can also sign up for paid streaming services as well, including Discovery Plus and MGM Plus. I think this is a great move for Sling, as they have a lot of competition from other live TV streaming services like Hulu and YouTube TV, with Fast becoming the next big thing. They need to get out there with a great service, and I think rebranding it away from Sling is good. Free stream sounds basic, but it does sound like its own thing, unlike Sling Free, which sounds like a cheap version of a product. Netflix marches on with their password crackdown, with them announcing it being expanded to four more countries. This includes New Zealand, Canada, Spain, and Portugal. Variety is reporting that Netflix is picking up a show from Showtime after they dropped it. We will talk about further changes at Paramount and Showtime in a few minutes, but they dropped another show called Ripley, starring Andrew Scott, which is currently in the middle of post-production. Variety is also reporting that the deal is not yet completed, but is expected to soon. Netflix also released a trailer for Luther, The Fallen Sun. The film is a continuation of the Luther show and will have a limited release in theaters February 24th and available to stream March 10th. The trailer looks good and you can tell there's a bit more of a budget behind it as well. I hope this is not the end of Luther and at the very least they continue the series via films. Without reporting numbers, Disney has announced that Black Panther Wakanda Forever is the biggest Marvel premiere on Disney Plus over its first five days. Can't say I'm surprised as it was the best Marvel movie last year. Apple has renewed their spy show to around for a third season and has added Hugh Laurie. He will play the role of a South African nuclear inspector. No word yet on when production will start, but I wouldn't expect the show to come back until 2024 at the earliest. Speaking of Hugh Laurie, HBO has canceled Avenue 5 after two seasons. This isn't much of a surprise as the show had okay reviews and never really developed a strong fan base. So if cuts have to be made, this one makes sense. Deadline is exclusively reporting that Decision to Leave has become the most watched film on movies streaming service. Don't know numbers were released. Movie, if you haven't heard, is a smaller distributor that focuses on the curation of films, and they have the streaming rights to Decision to Leave. From what I found, they have between 8 to 10 million subscribers, which, for a small streaming service, isn't bad. What's good here is that by getting the right films, they can build up interest in their service. Taking a look at Amazon where they have renewed the Perpetual for a second season and are turning Bosch into a franchise. Variety is reporting that Amazon Studios is developing two shows set in the Bosch universe. One focused on Bosch's partner Jerry Edgar and another focused on Renee Ballard, a LA detective in the Cold Crimes division. It is not known yet if these shows will be on Prime Video or Freevee, 
where the sequel to Bosch, Bosch Legacy is. I was a big fan of the Bosch show when it aired and haven't gotten a chance to watch Legacy yet. If these do happen, I'd definitely watch The Edgar Show and would try to watch the other one as well. What was great about Bosch is that it didn't try to do anything special, just be a well-done drama. Now let's get to the weird news from Amazon, and that is an exclusive from Variety. What is it? Well, Amazon and Sony are working on a live-action Spider-Man noir show. It'll be set in the 1930s. However, the main character will not be Peter Parker. It'll also be set in its own universe, so it has nothing to do with the MCU, a lot like the other Sony Marvel films. I saw this, and I was just dumbfounded as to what the pitch was that got Amazon on board. Who knows? Maybe Amazon is taking whatever they can in regards to Marvel content, which at this point really is whatever Sony is offering them. As for me, I'd be a lot more interested in the show if Nicolas Cage got the main role. Sticking with Amazon, or more specifically MGM+, Plus, they have gotten the U.S. rights to The Portable Door, an adventure comedy film that stars Christoph Waltz and Sam Neill. The film is set to be on the service sometime in April. I think what this shows is that it is not just updated branding for MGM+, Plus, and that there does seem to be a push to get content for it. Now, this film by itself won't push the needle much on new subscribers, but it does start to improve their library. Warner Brothers Discovery almost... Almost made it a week without news, but it's being reported that they are changing their streaming plans slightly. Before, the plan was to combine HBO Max and Discovery Plus into one big service, and that would be it going forward. Well, now the rumors are that it will still happen, but Discovery Plus will also stay independent, at least for the domestic market. As for why, well, the Wall Street Journal is reporting that the executives are worried if they force Discovery Plus subscribers to the combined service, a lot of them will just cancel. I do think that's actually a valid concern, as Discovery Plus without ads is $6.99 per month. So to go from that to paying at least minimum $16 per month, if not more, yeah, some might cancel. I was already wrestling with if I should keep subscribing to the combined service, depending on the price hike. But if that happens, and Discovery Plus gets to stay as a separate option and not HBO, I will probably just cancel and only sign up for the HBO shows I want to watch when they come out. Now, let's head to Paramount, where after last week, they announced the changes coming to Showtime. They immediately got to work. Last week was the dropping of shows, and this week seems to be the announcement of new ones, though most of them are, I would say, uninspired. First, Showtime picked up Uncoupled, which was a romantic show on Netflix. It was canceled by them after one season, which was released last year. Showtime will go ahead with a second season, and I would assume the first season will move over to Showtime at some point. I haven't watched it, so I don't know if it was a solid pickup, but hey. At least they're adding now. Another show in development at Showtime is The Department. This is based on The Bureau, a French spy thriller show released a few years ago. Along with this, George Clooney has signed on to direct the series. This one will likely be worth a watch. Now let's get to the uninspired shows that were announced, which were a bunch of spin-offs. You like Billions? Well, you might get a lot more with four potential spin-offs in development. This includes Billions London, Billions Miami, Millions, and you guessed it, Trillions. Don't worry, Dexter is also getting more shows with a sequel series to New Blood in the Works, which would star Dexter's son and possibly a spin-off focused on the Trinity Killer. So yeah, a lot is in the works for those franchises. From a business perspective, I get it, the Yellowstone spin-offs have been a hit, and you need to build up some franchises, so these are easy ones to do. My concern, though, is I feel you need, you need to do this and balance it out with some original content as well. And right now, that's only the department. While Showtime is not as loved as much as HBO, it does have a view of higher quality content compared to most channels, if we're talking about cable, even a bit higher than FX and AMC. So if Paramount wants to position it as higher-end content within Paramount+, Plus, they need to deliver shows that fit it. And the last story is Yellowstone, where it might be ending sooner than expected. It's being reported that Paramount and Kevin Costner are at odds with how to move forward. The issue stems from Costner over time, giving less and less availability to Paramount to shoot his scenes for the show. This is an issue for production, as shows can film for months at a time, depending on how much is needed. They are not like films where, depending on your part, you could be done in a few weeks. So for them to have to schedule setting up filming locations, costumes, and basically everything around Costner's schedule, well, I can see Paramount getting annoyed. That's why it comes as no surprise. The second part of this news is if they can't figure out something the plan is to just end the show. Yep, they would end Yellowstone with the backup plan being a sequel series with some of the main cast returning and getting Matthew McConaughey to star in it. He would be a great replacement for Costner, who at this point might want the show to end. Remember, he is directing a Western film for Warner Brothers, so he likely cares a lot more about that at this point. 
But who knows what's going to happen. While it's a bit shocking it would actually happen, it would not be a big loss for Paramount, especially if they can get the sequel series for Paramount+. Plus. Also, the spin-off shows, so far, have been doing really good for Paramount+, Plus, and they don't have Kevin Costner in them, so it's not like they need him to continue this franchise. And that is it for this episode of Box Office Receipts. If you want to follow me on Twitter or Facebook, links to the, those pages are in the show notes. Thank you for listening, and see you next time.